the S&P 500 makes all-time highs on the biggest earnings day of the year. Plus, lumber and copper show no signs of slowing. When will it end? To make sense of this and more, I'm joined by Real Vision's Weston Nakamura. Weston, how are you doing? How are you, Jack? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. I'm getting uh, off a three-day vacation, so I'm just getting really reacquainted with the markets and, and the sort of the flow. So I'm so grateful that you're here to help me uh, you know, explain it for me. How are you? I, I wouldn't consider three days of vacation, and I'm pretty sure you can just catch up, but happy to do it for you. I'm, and I'm well, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm glad to hear it. So, Weston, today is one of the biggest earnings day of the year. There were 60 S&P 500 companies that reported their earnings today. And of course, 60 in the S&P 500, of which there are 500 companies, but actually 505 stocks. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing blowout numbers across the board. And, you know, that's what we've seen this week. We saw from Google, from Facebook, from Apple, we saw absolutely eye-popping numbers. I think one thing that I've got my on is, is Google, um, it was $15.63 was expected for their earnings per share. They actually posted $26.29. So how are you making sense of this blowout uh, earnings season and how the market is reacting? Okay, so when you say expected, you're talking about... Um, like 15 people on the sell side and Wall Street analysts, right? As opposed to the markets, right? <laughs> so the expectations are by people who they, I, I mean, especially in this kind of uncertain environment, earnings environment, um, you cannot be too bullish and then overshoot and be the only one who misses. So everyone's going to kind of, you can't be bearish, of course. But they're going to be a little bit more conservative. So, of course, they're going to beat that much. And that's why. But the markets don't listen to them and the markets see right through that. That's why, you know, of course, you get a big pop on like a Facebook or, a, you know, but you're not going to get a, a 50 percent move on the stock. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that that's just a function of markets versus literally a handful of people who um, are, are so-called the, the estimates. So. Yeah, I think that you know, in the same way that um, you know, Wall Street analysts, they always say that they never really put a sell sell signal on a stock um, unless they're totally convinced. Because if you put a buy side on a buy signal on a stock, a buy rating on a stock, and you're wrong, you know, you're you're just wrong. That's the end of it. But if you put a sell signal on a stock and you're wrong, you could actually lose your job because the CEO gets pissed off and. You know, the CEO is the one who directs who who does the investment banking work, and it's all it's all related. Well, um, yeah, you're, yeah, you're go not ahead. gonna you're not gonna just lose your job. You're not gonna be able to get hired somewhere else either because uh, that company will now cut you off from investor relations. And so you're if you're covering Amazon or something like that um, as an analyst for however many years, and then you suddenly put a sell signal on Bezos, you're not gonna get into that. So therefore, you're you're now useless as an analyst. Doesn't matter what, what shop you go to, you're not gonna no, no IR is going to talk to you anyway. So you, you that's career suicide, right? Right, and it's some it's kind of works the opposite way for earnings expectations, as you mentioned, which is they put a somewhat artificially low bar for expectations so that it always looks like like they they beat it. Um, but but Weston, I so I actually was reading a paper, and even considering that phenomenon. This is still a phenomenal quarter for the S and P 500 in terms of earnings because generally the five-year median average for companies beating their uh, expectations is about 74%. So 74% of companies beat their earnings, but for this quarter it's 90%. So things really are heating up. And I know we had some somewhat questionable data for, from the economic side, but for me, Weston, it, it looks extremely bullish for earnings. A am I wrong? Do you disagree? No, I, I I don't I don't disagree at all. I don't think, and the markets certainly don't disagree. I mean, what are we at? 40, 40, 4,200, right? Um, the the markets seem to have anticipated all of this, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, even even a even the GDP print for that, for example. Um, I mean, that's a phenomenal print, but the, yeah. doesn't really phase the markets. Um, what I'm thinking is, what if the markets what if you get these sort of, uh, you know, amazing numbers out of Google and out of Apple and and so on and so forth, even with like kind of shaky guidance given semiconductors and all that. Uh, imagine, you know, and then U.S. GDP came out like six percent, something like that. And then the market sold off. That's, you know, that that's a possibility. Right. And that means that things were way too frothy indeed and priced in. And they're just 
it's gonna, you know, there's this, it's gonna be a, a wave of profit taking after that. So what what's happening in markets right now is what better be happening because if they went the other way, um, it can cascade. Yeah, that makes a, a lot of sense. And there is some suggestion that the balloon could be off the rose a little bit with the economic data because 6.4% uh, annualized quarter over quarter growth, of course, that is you know very good number, but it was actually slightly below the expectations. I know right. you're probably like, oh, Jack, Jack's the expectations guy. But you know, these are economists um, who would admittedly do, you know, tend to work at banks. But uh, the, I think the, the sort of actual goal was 6.6 the expectations, and it was slightly below that. Likewise, uh, initial claims, continuing claims for joblessness was slightly above expectations, which is, of course, not what you want. So the economic data today wasn't too great. What did you make, what did you make of that? I, I mean, uh, I, I don't know about not too great. I mean, it was, pre it was, pretty, it was pretty great for, from a, just a nominal standpoint. But I, I hear what you're saying. But um, what, what I'll say about what, you, you know, regarding um, the the Wall Street banks and their uh, macro department versus the stock analysts is that the um, the economists will actually I mean, because you, there is no United States investor relations department that they that they have that they're at conflict with right so like it's just those are just the macro numbers and and if it's if they say like we expect GDP to be terrible uh, Janet Yellen's not going to come knocking down you know on your door or anything like that right so. Um, I mean, it's if you make a bad call, you're gonna make a bad call. But there is no conflict of interest and like corporate politics involved with that. So it's more honest. I'm not saying it's more right. It is, but it is at least um, done in 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 good, you know, earnest. Weston, uh, let's move on to the the Fed meeting yesterday. I know Peter Bookvar and Ed covered it quite extensively, but as someone who was on vacation, um, could you <laughs> just break it down for me? You know, the headline I got is. Everything's unchanged, same old, same old, just like the you know million past Fed meetings that we've had. Anything of note there for you? Um, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I'm pretty sh sure that Powell said that copper was frothy. No, this is not verbatim, but you know, it, it alluded to that. But um, no, I think that the, what's happening with the Fed is just it's a very interesting. Like the mar the markets, like the F Fed fund futures markets and the euro dollar um, futures just. Do not believe what what they're saying. Essentially, that he, he's saying like we we are going to we're going to continue with this easy monetary policy. Like this this is what's gonna we're not gonna raise rates. We're not thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking about right. And then now you have um, what is it J June twenty twenty three priced in um, for a hike. Um, and and that's you know I mean futures market is is getting increasingly uh, more skeptical and they're. They're fighting the Fed um, in in at least the the, the front end. So um, and, Wes, and then you, you have so the two year yield like totally anchored down too. So the June 2023 futures that you're saying that the market is pricing in the Fed to raise the effective funds federal federal funds rate yeah. um, at that date. That is pretty late though. That's not 2022. You know, uh, a few months ago you were hearing people say, oh, they're definitely going to be raising the rates by by December 2022 at the latest. And tell me about also what's the delta between the the June 2023 and what the Fed is cuz you know the dot plot I mean it's it's far out but it's not you know they're saying they're going to raise it within like 2024, right? Well, they're they're not saying they're not going to say anything like they're not going to even, you know, they're they're totally on a we are not going to raise rates period. If we should raise rates, it will have to be a very convincing um, you know, data dependent macro environment for which we do. So this is why he kept keep saying like, you know, I'm not even thinking about thinking about, but then at the same time, you know, you're all right. So if inflation is transitory is what um, Powell's been saying, right? Um, of course, it's going to be like, you know, the, the, off of these comps, of course, it's going to be some like short term inflation. It's transitory. It's not, it's not real. And therefore we're not going to, but by the time that you know whether or not it's transitory, like the inflate uh, the the trend in inflation it's it's too late and it's you know inflation has has been here it's not it's not trend story right and so they have to what suddenly calibrate and start hiking rates like you know immediately no they're they're gonna have to figure out a way uh to signal to the market that they acknowledge that this might not be transitory and that they might start taking some action and that's a very long process as it is 
and inflation comes a lot faster in in you know um, in the real world than they have in terms of forget hiking the rates like like signaling that they're going to start hiking rates and all that. So they're in a really really rough spot, I think. So I, I hope for like their sake, not that I really care, but I hope that for their sake, um, they are right that this is transitory and the markets are are wrong about um, not believing the Fed. Weston, you talked about inflation in the real world. Well, we kind of are seeing that, at least in commodity prices. Copper, lumber, oil, these show no signs of stopping. Lumber is at all-time highs. Copper is at uh, $449. But if you actually do it by the ton, it's at over $10,000 per ton. Uh, yeah, so that, it, that was a headline. It broke through the LME, um, the, the London. Um, that's, a very, that's a very psychological key level. It is. It is. What do you make of the continued surge in commodity prices? Um, I mean, I can give you the generic answers of inflation and you know supply side and demand side and and this and that. Um, here, here's what I'll say. So copper, if so, if you look at actually palladium, palladium too is just on, on an absolute tear. Um, copper and palladium have been kind of neck and neck as to these the you know the 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 metals that are just that have just been on a straight hockey stick uh, upwards, um, and but if you look at palladium futures um, on NYMEX, um, and I mentioned this, mentioned this to you before, but like after March 2020, so last year after that collapse, um, this whole time this rally has been happening, it's been doing it on volume that is one fourth of what it's been for the last, I don't know, several years to a decade. So it's trading at one quarter of the, so one quarter of the volumes left, 75% of the volume that it used to trade at the, the uh, plating futures is totally gone. And where it went, I don't know who it is. I don't know, but I mean, if are, are they just speculators left? Are they just um, the producers, the commercials that are left? maybe a little bit of both but either way though it's there's not a lot of conviction at all in terms of actual volume notional volume traded um in these futures contracts copper did take a dip down um in, in volume and it's kind of leveled back up but you would think that you know usually when you see a, a move like this there should be also a a corresponding gradual increase in volume as well and open interest and volume and open interest has been flat at best on copper on at least on um on on hg uh contracts so it they don't they don't really reconcile with one another you know the like the volume behind it and the actual price um itself so um i i don't know where where this this tops out i mean if the copper like hg1 contracts are basically um you know they, they match up really well with um china a shares and I mean, if you get basically a pullback in China, you're going to get a pullback in copper. Until then, though, you know, I I think that the what what's to, what's to stop it, right? And you know, Weston, so you are in Japan, uh, so close to China. For those of us who aren't as as plugged into that part of the world, how is the Chinese economy doing? Obviously, not obviously, but you know, it was. At, at the vanguard of pulling the world sort of out of the COVID collapse because you know, they did lockdown so early. And I just, I just remember in that you know, May area, their, their PMIs were incredibly high while the rest of the world, particularly Europe and the US, was just, uh, it, was, it was a disaster. So how is uh, the Chinese economy faring? Um, because you, know, you did mention that it's, it's a key input for, for copper demand. Yeah, um, I, I don't know and nobody knows because China's data is not reliable. Uh, what I'll say about China is, I mean, essentially, this is they they've been exporting de deflation for a decade, decade and a half, right? Now they're exporting inflation. Um, let's see if that has legs. I I don't explain know. that for me, Weston. Explain that. What do you mean? I get the deflation thing, but when you say they're exporting inflation, what does that mean? Well, the, if they're driving up prices of base metals and they're trying to drive you know the, these these um the entire supply chain essentially um starting at the at the very beginning if they're um just you know essentially front running themselves on these um 
on on these input costs on these raw materials. Um, th- I mean, they're they're importing from Australia while picking fights with Australia, and and everywhere everywhere else for that matter. Um, I just I don't I don't understand like how it's possible that they have that much demand, um, especially when half of the world is still in. It's not you know, we're not we're not at full capacity at all, right? And how are they stronger than they were like like demand stronger than it was prior to COVID? Um, I, I I don't know. Um, so the um, the yuan being uh, you know very strong against the um, the dollar over the last say what's called six to nine months or so that's also been kind of troubling. I I've, I've always been fearing this like uh, August twenty uh, August twenty fifteen sudden shock uh, yuan deval uh, might come, um, but. Um, but yeah, China, China is, is, is a mystery for, to everyone. And this is why copper is really a, a mystery. Uh, the one thing I'll say too about copper is that, um, you know, there is this whole, like, so, so Joe Biden, he gave his speech yesterday, um, the American jobs act and this and that. Right. And it's very much a clean energy, um, driven agenda, um, that ties into both the climate change agenda, the jobs agenda, the, you know, the infrastructure agenda and, and, and all that, right? So if that's the case, and this is happening, it's not just Joe Biden, this is happening globally, right? But essentially, um, the average, I think I, I read this, like the average electric car um, needs somewhere around 400 pounds of copper. And the average, um, you know, fossil fuel burning automobile needs about like somewhere between 20 and 50 pounds. So a fra- like a, a small fraction of that. So, I mean, that's also, g- if that's the case and that's the way that things, you know, copper is basically front running EV demand, right? And so, so there's that, there's this, this there's semiconductors, there's, there's, a, there's a, an actual, you know, uh, fundamental case for it. But at, at what price does it become you know, un- unbearable to pass on to, to to keep passing on down to your customers, right? So um, yeah, we'll find out, I, I suppose. Yeah, and I've also got my eye, in addition to copper and copper producers like Freeport MacBrand, there's lithium producers, there's rare earth producers, all of these inputs that will be uh, key to electric vehicles. It's interesting with lithium and the, the rare earth, you've seen a little bit of a pullback over the, let's say, past two months. Um, they kind of trade like a Tesla, a proxy for Tesla, um, somewhat rather than a proxy for a reflationary commodity trade. But Weston, let's let's turn away from commodities. Let's go into the the you know the true macro world of FX uh, rates. You know, in, in bond yields, we've seen um, a sell off today in bonds, at least in, in the U.S. Um, perhaps related to Biden's speech yesterday. Um, but we you know we kind of remain in this holding pattern of about one point one point five to. 1.6 in the 10 year. How are you making sense? You know, what stands out to you? Well, um, here's what I'll say about uh, U.S. Treasury specifically. So the last time I was um, on RVDB was actually the end of the uh, Japan fiscal year, which ends it at the very the last day of March. And I think that that's when we had filmed it um, going into uh, April. So the start of fiscal year, uh, this new fiscal year. So the sell-off that you see in treasuries year to date has been pretty pretty brutal, right? Um, much of that, especially from February, was due to uh, Japan, was due to the Japanese um, you know, b- buyers of U.S. treasuries. So Japan is the largest uh, creditor to the United States um, and all that. The, the Japanese flow is very, it's very significant. Um, and so... The move that happened from call it say one percent on the ten year, all the way through you know up upwards that happened in 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 uh sort of like what is it beginning of February or so, um until March um thirty first until that that year uh fiscal year end point, that was a much of that was um I mean it's a momentum trade like one person starts selling a lot of you know, holders start selling but. A lot of that flow comes directly from Japan. They're basically trying to close out their books for the year, but they did it much, much earlier than they otherwise would have um, because of the fact that they 
got caught up in the 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 cell momentum essentially. So normally what you would see is something around three billion dollars per day of treasury selling into uh, at the end of like the last two weeks of March, um, right up until like April 1st, and then it reverses. That ha- started happening in mid-February from Japan, um, according to the data. And so that so so that that's what caused that that um, you know that spike in yields. But then you see the uh, the market turn around, right? And then you start seeing buyers come in. You know, you start seeing uh, yields come down on the long end. And that happened on April first. That's the new fiscal year of Japan. That's when they came in, and they started buying back treasuries, uh, buying treasuries uh, again. And that's what you've been seeing up until yesterday, because starting yesterday, um, so Wednesday, from Wednesday, uh, and currently until next Thursday, uh, Japan has entered Golden Week, which is a week long holiday. It's the longest um, stretch of like time off that Japan has annually. Um, Japan is completely closed everywhere. So the Japan equity trading, uh, JGB trading, all that. But that means that there are also um, Japanese traders absent from the market in international markets. So you don't have the overnight U.S. Treasury buyers, which is probably why you're seeing some weakness in Treasuries over the last two days, uh, the absence of them. Um, but Weston, sorry, you expect that the appetite for U.S. Treasuries will resume after Golden Weekends? Um, it, it, they, it, it may, but what, what could also have happened was that prior to golden week, they could have loaded up, you know, as much as possible because that's a long time, like, you know, like seven days, um, to be absent from the market. And so if they're trying to reposition their books and, get you know, treasuries on the books that they just sold, um, get them back on their books, like life insurance companies, um, you know, uh, commercial banks, wh- whoever it may be, asset managers, long loanlies, um, they're going to front load all their, their buying that they need to do, maybe like compress it like a month's worth of buying that they would otherwise have done. They're going to compress it into that, you know, right before this uh, this golden week period, because this is the, the month end for them. Like two days ago was a month end for them, essentially. Like today is the actual month end, but um being that the holiday was coming that you know so that's why you saw an excessive amount uh more of of buying and now that they're absent well look at you can see what's happening to yields today and so people try to like kind of compare that to like uh oh look at the market reaction to you know us um gdp figures of oh it's not it's not that it's not that at all it's it's not biden's speech i mean sure some of it can be but um, by and large, it's the absence of a major, major player in in the market. Um, I have this chart that I um, that I sent over to you. If you want to, let's do yeah. it. IEF is um, for those who aren't familiar, is basically um, so it's kind of like TLT, um, but it's, it's TLT is like twenty years, uh, uh, yeah, twenty year maturity and, and above. IEF it targets the seven to ten year U.S. Treasury maturity. Um, it's an ETF by BlackRock iShares, and it's fairly liquid. It trades on you know um, it's U.S. listed. There's also um, a Japan listed um, version of IEF. There's two of them actually. Um, One six five six is the um, is the ticker code uh, for um, Japan trading. Um, I share seven ten year U.S. Treasury ETF one six five six, and then there's also one four eight two, which is the same thing seven ten year uh, U.S. Treasury, but this one four eight two is FX hedged. So the the same ETF, but one is FX hedged, one is not same maturity. And if you look at the chart, all I did is just you know I've normalized it as a percent from year date, and you'll notice that IEF the the U.S. Um, the ten year U.S. Treasury essentially is down down about six percent or so um at its lows in, in april and that go that basically is percent for percent down with um 1482 the fx hedged version that would make sense because if it's fx hedge is the same thing as more or less the same thing as buying um you know a, a usd a usd denominated um investor buying us treasuries 
Right, but, right. So just say, so, sorry, let me explain. Yeah. So, um, so the blue line is that ETF of seven to tre- ten year duration treasuries. Yeah. Belly that's of the, the US one. That's the that's the blue. You know, as we that's the blue line. As we know, it's performed badly, down uh, four point nine five percent year to date. And then, if you if you're a Japanese person and a Japanese investor, and you want to get exposure to that, but it's it's hedged, so you don't buy it. You know, in yen. Uh, surprise, surprise. You know, it's it's performed very similarly, down. Negative five point seven two, maybe a basis point there for basis point for uh, the the uh, ETF manager. But the <laughs> the green line, uh, yeah. the unhedged. You're saying that despite the fact that U.S. bonds have performed poorly in the market, because it's denominated in yen, you're actually you know basically even on your money, only down thirty five basis points. Exactly. If you so people think that like oh people are like getting killed in the U.S. Treasury market. Well, no, not necessarily. If you FX hedged. And essentially, if you're basically have the same exposure as a U.S. based USD denominated U.S. Treasury buyer, right? So an American buying uh, IEF. Um, if you have the same kind of positioning as that, then yeah, you're getting killed. If, however, you are um, long unhedged, um, you know, unhedged yen, you're flat on the year. You haven't really taken any losses this entire time. On a ten-year treasury that that has moved like a, a full percent, right? And so the the bottom uh, half of that chart is essentially um, what I did was the same exact chart, but I just threw dollar yen, um, also percent percent normalized um, year to date. And you'll notice that the dollar yen, USD JPY, and um, the uh, hedged US. Um, Treasury from Japan or the you know the the, the normal just ten, seven ten year U.S. Treasury ETF, they are basically mirror images of one another, right? Um, and they essentially negate each other, which is why you have a totally flat, unhedged um, U.S. Treasury um, you know year to date performance um, from from a Japan perspective. So Japanese investors, so Japanese like buyers are do a lot of them are doing it totally unhedged uh, fx unhedged and they they've been fine like there there is no sell-off because the yen has been offsetting um the uh the losses that that otherwise would have occurred right that's such occurred. a key point and this is something that i actually covered with uh nick correa on the exchange which is if you had bought a european bond uh, yielding negative uh having negative yield you know, oh my God, you're such a sucker. Well, actually, you would have done way better because you would have been dominated in the euro, which has appreciated dramatically against the dollar over the past year. So, sort of the world of interest rates and the world of currencies, we think of them as different, but they're kind of like you know, it's space and time, space time. Um, Weston, as we as we you know are close to the end, can you just uh, quickly talk about uh, the Bank of Japan Governor Kuroda's uh, uh, recent speech, which has been called a non-event, but you have a different take. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's not a non-event. Um, it's not. I wouldn't say it's an event per se. Uh, you know what? I'll I'll call it an event. Uh, so Kuroda, this guy, I've been basically stalking for the last several years. Um, you know, I've w- watching every every Bank of Japan meeting and all that kind of thing. He did something this time that was for the first time I've ever seen that really kind of freaked me out. So policy wise, yeah, no change. Um, slight uptick in uh, growth forecasts and like a, a slight uh, down to like 10 basis points down in, in CPI. Who cares? Kuroda, who is this like kind of like a like a car salesman guy um, about, you know, positivity and all that kind of thing. He's been basically pushing this, uh, trying to sell this like my policy of like QQE, negative rates, yield curve control. Um, we're we're gonna generate inflation, or we're gonna get out of deflation um, with with this radical monetary policy. That was supposed to be uh, a two year process starting in 2013. Um, in two years, we're supposed to get two percent um, price stability or inflation. Uh, so by 2015 is when that was supposed to happen. It's been eight years, and there's <laughs> they've gotten nowhere close to that, right? And and so he spent fourfold the time making excuses. Uh, as to why it's not working, oil and this and that, uh, but this everything's fine and all that. And then you know, th- then the actual policy was itself was supposed to take right. This time, however, he said uh, he might as well have said like, "Yeah, I failed," because what he said was, "We will not hit um, that two percent inflation target during my tenure." 
his tenure ends in April of 2023. That's a long time from now. So why he would like why he would say this, I haven't I don't know. Uh, it's it's insane to me. Um, but you don't buy 500 trillion yen worth of JGBs with printed yen and then call it a day. Like you, there's no half measures. That's like that's unacceptable. You either buy all of it and you burn all of it, or you don't lay a single hand on, especially at the long end of the um of the JGB curve. But you don't buy up like half of the quadrillion yen of debt outstanding and then say like, oh, sorry, like you know we're what are you gonna do? Like sell that position in the market? You've already you know completely um distorted the what used to be the second most liquid and uh active uh sovereign rate market in the world so either he really did buy 500 trillion yen worth of jgbs and is mailing it in or he's got something up his sleeve what fascinating stuff weston um i just want to just i just got this across the tape amazon reported uh their results this is from the wall street journal first quarter sales hit 108 billion a 44 percent increase from the, it's year over year, uh, and their profits more than tripled to 8.1 billion. And then an after market after uh, hours trading, it's up 4.14 percent. So what is that? Like 70 billion dollars for a 1.8 trillion dollar company. So you know some some big moves um, in the in the mega cap stocks. 70 70 billion dollars. That's like two Doge coins. But um, Weston, you and I are going to take this chat off into the exchange. We're going to hop into the hive hive mind um, for real quick for a little after hours session. Uh, so we want we want to talk about this. I want to hear your your thoughts on Kuroda, which you just talked about. But also, you noticed a very interesting pairs trade or, or sort of a proxy uh, thing going on between Bitcoin and a certain Japanese equity security. Can you, in two minutes or less, just tell yeah. the audience what that is, and then we'll get into the weeds in the exchange. Sure. Um, for those of you who are watching Bitcoin um, and who are watching uh, Grayscale and the um, premium or the um discount to nav and all that kind of thing forget all that look at just just like really just just forget that um there's a company called monex in japan right uh m-o-n-e-x they are a two billion dollar market cap very kind of small um it's like an e-trade it's an online um uh brokerage company it's one of the large ones in japan they and also they do, do crypto, trading. For crypto right yeah yeah they do but mostly like equities and all that kind of thing um their ticker symbol um, is what is it? It is eight six nine eight. This is the most um, accurate, I suppose, um, Bitcoin proxy there is out there. They trade percent for percent on an intraday basis, on an in inter and intraday basis uh, with Bitcoin. What I will say about this, the whether or not it's a proxy is not is not a question. It, it is a proxy. What I will say is, uh, I wrote something on the exchange, which you're free to. Feel free to take a look at, but I made the case that Monex is actually not a Bitcoin proxy. Bitcoin has now become a proxy by accident of Monex. In other words, Monex is uh, dictating price action for Bitcoin. And this is why people who are in either side, the crypto side or the traditional asset side, you need to learn each other's markets because these markets are converging with one another. I mean, there's, they're clearly overlapping. So I make a case for that. I'm happy to share that on the exchange. Okay, and so that post is on the exchange, and you and I right now will go to the exchange and talk about it in depth. We'll post it in about an hour. Uh, well, Weston, thank you so much for uh, coming on the Daily Briefing again. Thanks a lot. Oh, I just want to say one more thing too. UBS, add that to the list of um, Argos um, Prime Brokers. Thanks for the transparency, UBS. <laughs> <laughs> of course. All right. Talk to you, Weston. All right. Thanks.